Psalm 45. To the choir master, according to the lilies, a maskil of the sons of Korah, a love song. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verse to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one. In your splendor and majesty, in your majesty ride out victoriously. For the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness, let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The people fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloe and cassia. From ivory places, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty, since he is your lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes she is led to the king, with her virgin companions following behind her. With joy and gladness, they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. In place of your father shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. Amen. Well, as we come to Psalm 45, reading it in isolation, it's certainly an interesting and a unique psalm. Uh, when seen in context, it is a bit strange. And even reading it, I think you can see it's a psalm that really seems uh, unequal to any other psalm in the Psalter. Uh, actually, commentators of every stripe look at this as uh, a rather difficult psalm to approach. So I would beg your mercy as we come to this this morning. But you'll see here in in the flow of book two of the Psalms, uh, the first three Psalms, 42, 43, and 44, are laments. They are crying out, asking God for help. And after Psalm 45, there are these reassurance, these Psalms that really speak to the Lord's kingship, as he is the great ruler, the one who reigns in Zion, the one who is this like rock and fortress. And then the transition point between these psalms is unusual in that it's a wedding psalm, a love song. It just seems out of place, particularly as you move through this psalm and you're left wondering, as the the end speaks of this name that will be remembered throughout all generations, that nations will praise you. And then you stop and think for a moment, Wait, who is this psalm about? There's several guesses. Probably the best guess would be Solomon, but the psalm doesn't tell us. And as we go through it, I think there's very deliberate reasons why the psalm doesn't. And so one thing, as you read this psalm, you may be thinking, well, why don't we just move to Christ and the church, which is where we will eventually end up. For I think that ultimately makes sense of the psalm, but we don't want to move there so quickly we ignore its original context. And so the psalm neatly divides into three parts. Uh, Verses 1 through 9 are the meditations on the king. Verses 10 through 15 are meditations on the queen. And then 16 and 17, they resume talking about the king, but they're this future blessing or this benediction placed upon this wedding. And so the psalmist begins in verse 1 about how he is overflowing. He's like a, a brook that's bubbling over when he contemplates his glorious king. He is just overwhelmed with emotion. 
This alone is also unique because many of the psalmists, when they're writing, don't usually tell us about them writing. And so we have here where the psalmist takes a moment to speak about himself before he speaks about his theme. But I do think it's helpful here when you see that, that for him, the psalmist, this theme is delightful. This is a theme that he just loves to think on, to contemplate, and to meditate on. And much of the reason is, is that in Israel's time, and as you read through the history of Israel, there's this very simple correlation that happens. A good king brings blessing, and a bad king brings curses. A good king brings a, a deepening relationship with the God of Israel, Yahweh, as he instructs and leads the people in righteousness. And a bad king leads people away from Yahweh, to the worship of idols, to sin, and to depravity. In Israel's time, you can really count the kings, I want to say on one hand, <laughs> who accomplish this. And so this idea of a king who is righteous and the, the joyful time of his wedding ceremony and the, the thinking through of the posterity and of this kingdom of, of righteousness, you can see how even before we move to Christ and the church, that this is a theme that would be very important to the Israelites. You can think about the way in which God just simply institutes the, the uh, institution of marriage, how glorious that is in the beginning of the Bible. And here we have the most important man marrying his queen, the king of Israel. And so he moves into his theme in verse 2. And where we get these exalted images of the king. He is the most handsome of the sons of men. He is, in many ways, seems to be the ideal man. The most handsome. Grace is poured upon his lips. Not only is he uh, the most handsome of all men, but the words that he speaks are these words that are gracious. They are kind. They are good. And as we'll see, they're, they're humble and righteous. Uh, this evening, we'll be looking at James chapter 3 and about the tongue and speech and how what great good it can do and what great evil it can do. I mean, simply think here that, that having a king and his words, well, they matter more than the ordinary people's. But here he speaks graciously. And the psalmist says it's because God has blessed you forever. God has poured his blessing upon the king. And from that, all of these blessings flow out from the king to the people. But then we, we move from who the king is uh, to what the king does. In verses 3 and 4, we have this image that not only is he the most uh, gracious of men, the, the most handsome of men, but he's also this great hero, almost like this hero of old. So strap on your thigh, O mighty one, the heroic one. And he's, he's pictured here as riding high, resplendent in his armor and his glory and his majesty. And he rides out victorious. That his, his, his goal as he goes out into war is already assured. He will be victorious. For Yahweh is with him. But note the, the reason that, that he goes out to fight. He is not going out to fight in order to simply uh, increase his own lands. He is going out in the cause of truth, meekness, and righteousness. You could also think of it as truth and then humble righteousness. The Hebrew is just kind of a string of words here at the end. And so he rides out because he is concerned of truth, and he goes out in humble righteousness. And this, this theme of righteousness is, is woven throughout the psalm later. His scepter is a scepter of uprightness. He is a king who is supremely righteous, a king who speaks truth, a king who has grace poured upon his lips, and a king who is humble. I mean, really think of what leader we know of, who your first thought is, oh, they are humble. <laughs> and here we have what seems to be the most perfect man who could glory in all sorts of his attributes and his deeds, and yet... He is humble. And he continues, let your right hand, meaning your, your powerful hand, teach you awesome 
deeds, that he is to, to go forth and to conquer. And also it switches from the idea of a sword to arrows. And here he is one who is firing arrows with deadly accuracy at his enemies. And they fall. That almost seems as if it's one arrow is fired and it pierces the heart of the king's enemies. And they fall one after another after another. And so he goes forth in victory and his enemies do not stand a chance before him. In many ways, this is, this is alluding to or hearkening back to Psalm 2. You'll remember the way in which the Lord speaks about his king, the one he has enthroned upon Zion, his son. And the way he tells the enemies, the kings who have burst their bonds, who are, are marshalling this great army in battle to go before the Lord and his anointed. It ends by saying, kiss the son lest he be angry. Basically, the theme there is you are not going to win. And don't dare think about trying or you'll face his wrath. So then the psalm continues as we meditate upon uh, the king's character and the king's deeds. We end in verse 6 with a very strange set of words. It says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the question here is, who is he talking about? Because on the first read through, you would just simply say, well, yes, of course, God, who is eternal, his throne is forever and ever. That's not really a novel or new thing. But the question then becomes at the end of verse seven, he says, therefore, God, your God has anointed you. And so it's at the end of verse 7 that the psalmist has to clarify that there is someone he's talking about as God and someone he's talking about as God who has anointed the other one. (laughs) And suddenly you have this idea here that, that he's likely talking about the king. And in fact, I would say he is talking about the king at the beginning of verse 6 because that's why verse 7 clarifies this distinction. And you'll have to think back to uh, the time in which this is being written. These words are, well, they're a bit shocking. And the reason they're shocking is that Israel's nations that surrounded them, this was one of the main sins that they were guilty of, which was deifying their kings. You can think of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is viewed as a king. You can think of Nebuchadnezzar. His sin was basically assuming that he was God until God put him in his place. And so it's this constant tendency of these great rulers to assume that they're also divine. And so Israel has never fallen into that. Out of all the sins that they did, and there was a mountain of sins, they had never deified their king. And so for now, the psalmist to write those words, you can see how they start to become either they're just a fantastic hyperbole, or we get into dangerous territory inside Old Testament monotheism. Well, thankfully, the solution to this problem is rather easy, for Hebrews simply quotes this and says, this is about the Lord Jesus. They say here is is testimony to the fact that there is one God and three persons, that the Son is also fully divine, now that here you start to see uh, the, the ways in which the, the Trinity is, is, is almost starting to burst forth from the Old Testament. It's still, it's in types and shadows. But here we have the king being talked about in divine terms, distinguished from God who is divine. And we'll come back to that point, but it is, it is interesting to note here as he, he gives this message to the king. And then again, he speaks of the scepter of his kingdom as a scepter of, of, of uprightness, that his kingdom, what, what uh, defines his kingdom, when you look upon it, is righteousness, is uprightness, is obedience to the law and to the commandments of the Lord. And that the king was supposed to copy the law of Deuteronomy in order that he would know it <laughs> and that he would then enact it and that he would then teach it, and that it would flow from him down throughout all 
of Israel. And here we have this king who does that. Verse 7 begins that he loves righteousness and hates wickedness. Again, these are characteristics of God that the king is supposed to have. The ideal king is supposed to be one who loves the righteous and who punishes the wicked. And again, you see throughout history and even throughout Israel's history, kings who do the opposite, who love righteousness and attack, sorry, who love wickedness and attack the righteous. But then it continues after making this bold claim of speaking of the king as God and his uh, throne that is forever and ever. He therefore, he then comes back to this point that God, your God, has anointed you. And anointed is the same word that where we derive the word Messiah from. With the oil of gladness beyond your companions. God has poured forth his blessing upon you in an order of magnitude greater than anyone else in all the earth. And it continues that as we start to move from that into what looks like this great wedding ceremony, he's spoken of as his robes are fragrant with myrrh, aloe, and cassia, these great uh, spices and, and things that they, they just have a pleasing aroma to them. His robe is just talked about as if it is almost made up of those things. <coughs> and from ivory places, stringed instruments make you glad. And this is one of those uh, translators have a field day trying to figure out what is happening or being said in this verse. I think simply these last parts of this first section are, they're getting at the, the splendor of this king. So even where he lives and who he is surrounded by and what he wears, there's this great pomp to it. There's this great view that he is, he is so mighty and so blessed. He is arrayed in all these fine things. And even daughters of lesser kings are considered his ladies of honor. He's surrounded by the lesser kings, for he is the great king. And at his right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. We're not sure where Ophir is, but the Bible speaks of this as there's gold And then there's the gold of Ophir. This is the purest, the best. And here the queen stands and she's arrayed with gold. Later it speaks about her robe is intertwined with gold. She is shimmering and arrayed in all of these fine things. And so you have this meditation as this psalmist is reflecting upon his king and the great love that he has towards his king and the great blessing and the way he sees all that's happened to the king as coming from God. And so then he turns in verses 10 through 15 to turn to the queen, and he begins by calling the queen with these words, hear or or listen to my words, incline your ear. And he tells her that she is to forget her people and her father's house. It sounds here as if she is a foreigner, she's not from the tribes of Israel. And so we have here that situation where on the one hand, we've seen this in the Old Testament where Israelites marry those outside of the covenant community. And that is a thing that always ends badly, almost. For we do have instances of where those marry someone outside the covenant community who has converted and become a faithful Israelite. We can think back to the book of Ruth. She is a Moabite. Her people were so notoriously bad that there was a covenant stipulation not to allow them entry into the covenant community. I mean, so bad that the Lord writes down a prohibition against them in mass. But yet, Ruth shows more faithfulness at times than many other Israelites. And she converts. She leaves behind her family, her household, and her household gods and puts her faith and trust in Yahweh. In that sense, she becomes an Israelite. You see all these prohibitions in Israel about marriage outside as if it's uh, uh, xenophobic or as if they need to marry inside in order to keep genetically clean. That's never the point that God is making. He's not talking about genetics. He is talking about faithfulness to the covenant. And that's how you're always left with these two groups of people that you look out from Israel to. There are those who can come in, those who are invited to come in, and those who are in active rebellion 
against. And all of that to say this psalm would only make sense is if she, in the leaving of her father's house, is also leaving her father's gods and that she is becoming a true Israelite in faith. Uh, For otherwise, the psalmist wouldn't be writing this great love song. Because you'll notice in the life of Solomon how his many wives lead him into idolatry. And so she, like Ruth, is to forget her family ties and come into this new and glorious family. And the king will desire your beauty since he is your Lord bound to him. And you come here and as the queen is coming into this marriage ceremony, she's coming in to be married The psalmist simply reminds her that though she is the queen, there is still someone higher than her, and that who she is marrying is the king, and that she is to be subservient to him just as all the people are subservient to the king. And in verse 12, it speaks of people from Tyre bringing gifts. Uh, Possibly here, it's just simply taking a a wealthy nation. The Tyre was uh, a sea trader's. And that they are seeing this glorious marriage ceremony and they are are rejoicing as Gentiles coming in to bring gifts to this. In verses 13 through 15, we seem to have the the other side of the wedding ceremony now. As the princess is coming, she is robed with this uh, clothing that is many colors, uh, very rich and wealthy, and then rimmed with gold throughout with a, a train of virgins coming behind her, and there's this great joy and gladness as everyone's coming into the palace of the king. And so you have here this queen arrayed in all her splendor, but it's probably meant to also be reminded that this splendor and wealth that she now has is actually because of whom she's marrying, that she's marrying what looks to be the most powerful man in the world. And so she, by the virtue of that marriage, gains all of these great blessings and and wealth and honor uh, from him. And then verses 16 and 17, it's it's hard to read in the English who it's talking about, but uh, in the Hebrew, it's clearly in reference to the king. So the yours, so in the place of your fathers and your sons, and you will make them princes. Hebrew has a way of making sure that those are either masculine or feminine. And they're masculine in this case, which means that here he has changed now and is back talking about the king. I'm happy to show anyone the Hebrew behind it if you really so desire, or you can just trust me on this one. But so he switches back and speaks to the king. In place of your father shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. And so you're given this promise that seems to be reiterating the great promise the Lord gave to David, that he would have sons and really an eternal dynasty. But then in verse 17, you have the name of this king to be remembered throughout all generations. So his name will be remembered forever and all nations will praise him. And so you have to end this psalm, again, coming to two different potential conclusions. One of those is this guy is just trying to suck up to the king. And he has written this great hyperbole of this in order to stoke the ego of the king and maybe gain court favor with it. But as one commentator said, I thought this was great, just the way he phrased it. What if it's not? What if this is not a hyperbole? But what if what he says is true? Then suddenly we do, we we have to look at this Uh, real wedding that has taken place, this real king whom we don't know. And we have to start looking through it to something even greater. And so I don't think it is improper for us to take that move to see that clearly the only one who could actually fulfill all of this would be the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is God and is man, the one who will and is ruling forever and ever, the one who is meek and humble, but also righteous, the one who is arrayed in battle armor, the one who is victorious in all he does the one who is the most blessed, and the one whose words are always gracious. And I think what the psalmist then is if we're we're to move to look to the Messiah, then what he's trying to stir in us is he's trying to use this 
uh, theological text to move us into changing our feelings or to inciting our feelings. For in Revelation, the Lord Jesus speaks. He speaks to one of the churches and he tells them, you've lost your first love. You've lost your first love. And as we think about this psalm, I think it's easy to think, especially if you've been a Christian for some time, there can become those times where you are simply going through the motions. You go to church, you pray, you read your Bible, all good things. But then there's that nagging question. Maybe you remember the time of your conversion, or maybe you remember some kind of mountaintop experience or a season in which it just seemed the Lord was indeed lovely. And you loved with a a fervency that felt like a fire burning inside you. And then there are those days where you peel yourself off your bed and you move out in the day and you acknowledge God around meals, but you feel that lack of love. Now, on the one hand, the, the Bible wants to reassure you that your salvation is never based on your feelings. And so those days where you may feel low or empty does not mean you are any less a child of God. But I think what the psalm wants to get at is to say, if in those moments when you feel that way and you don't want to, well, Psalm 45 says, cry out to God, meditate upon his goodness, come back and look at the loveliness of the Lord Jesus Christ, see him as as who he really is, the, the greatest of men. The one who loves with an everlasting love. And the one who is the, the, the greatest, but yet took on the most humble form. Think of the juxtaposition here that you are the most handsome of all men. And the way Isaiah puts it, he was without form. He was, you were unable to look upon him because of his death and his movement towards his crucifixion. And so you have here this psalm, which I think wants to incite us back to our first love, to contemplate those things. And certainly as we get to this marriage with the queen, you have all the blessings that flow from the king to the queen. That who she is now, her status has changed now that she has married the king. I mean, that should be obvious, but she was not a queen before she married the king. And this idea of marriage as something that speaks of Christ's love for the church, uh, you may remember this is what Paul brings up in Ephesians when he is talking about marriage, but he, he takes marriage and he, then he moves from that into the great mystery that is Christ and the church. And so he, he founds upon a husband's love for his wife and a wife's love for for her husband, he says, actually, Christ and the church is what marriage ultimately points to. And it's this great mystery, he says. And it's wonderful to, to think about that, the way that a marriage should work, right? It should be a, a union that is never broken. But one way or another, it will be in death we say, in death, till death do us part. But the beauty of Christ in the church is that even through death, you're never parted. Paul says that much in Romans, that not even death can separate us from the love of God. And so you have this idea of this great wedding, this great feast, and sure enough, it approaches or comes up again at the end of the Bible In Revelation 19, there's this great wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roaring of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride has been made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, pure and bright, for the linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. 
So Psalm 45 pictures this glorious wedding between the king and the queen. But certainly with the fact that the Bible ends with this great wedding feast as the great groom comes and takes his bride to be with him forever. I think it is easy for us to make that jump from Psalm 45, this great wedding of a king and a queen that really took place. And to see that ultimately, I think that's why we don't know who the king is. We can make all sorts of guesses, but ultimately the psalm never tells us. And to me, I think that's deliberate because now you have to go, when I read this, I can't seem to pinpoint exactly which Israelite king this would be. But then I think of Christ and all he has done and his glorious bride, and suddenly you go, maybe that's ultimately what the Spirit was inspiring the psalmist to do. That though he didn't know fully, It seems at the end that every nation will praise you forever and ever. Again, these seeds being sown of an eternal kingdom to come. So, brothers and sisters, this morning, if you find yourself in those times of your love may be ebbing and flowing for your great Savior, this psalm calls you to say, to pray, to meditate, to think. And as John says, to just be reminded ultimately that our love wasn't the beginning of it but rather it was his love for us, that he loved us, Paul says, before the foundation of the world. John says he is simply is love. And that in Christ today, if you are in Jesus Christ, that means he loves you. He loves you. So let us take great hope from that. Let us meditate upon our glorious Savior, And let us come now to him in prayer and thankfulness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do know that there are times where our hearts seem deadened to you and to what you call us to be. So we do ask that, Father, we would just meditate upon Christ. We would see him in all his loveliness, in all of his glory, in all of his goodness and all of his might and majesty, and how now he is no longer a lamb but a lion, that he is clothed in immortality, that he holds with him the keys of death and Hades, for he has conquered, and that he is coming again with a host of heavenly angels. So, Father, let us see the glories of our Lord, our Lord, our Savior, and the one who loves us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Where our closing song is, His mercy is more. (laughs) But love could remember no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into the sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patient would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? We welcome the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. His sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. 
stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Hear these words from 1 Corinthians 13. Paul says this, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Paul here seeking to incite us to love one another. That love is founded ultimately in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it never ends. And so as we come to the Lord's Supper this morning, it is simply a a foretaste of a great wedding feast yet to come. Yes, we do this in remembrance that Christ has died, but we also do it until he returns. And just as at the resurrection, faith will be no more, At the resurrection, the celebration of the Lord's Supper will be no more, for there will be a greater celebration yet to come. And so as we come this morning, though you may be weak and weary, though there may be times of of deadness in your heart, there may just be simply times of trials and tribulations, of struggles, or there just may be times simply of great joy and happiness. And as we come to this table, it is to bring us to that great joy. It is to remind us of the love of God and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's to do so in in tangible items. Though the wine is just wine and the bread is just bread, yet they, they are tangible ways we can touch, taste, and see the gospel again. And so as we come this morning, let us take these elements And see, in a sense, pass them to this greater love as God seeks to to place that in us by us eating and us drinking to spiritually nourish our souls, to refresh us once more, and to keep reminding us week after week that I love you. And here is the evidence of that. Let us pray.